Welcome to The Entrepreneurial Musician with Andrew Hitz, a podcast from the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network featuring interviews with the best and brightest entrepreneurs and innovators in the music business. Today's episode features Canadian jazz pianist Ron Davis. Ron talks about his incredible journey to becoming one of the most acclaimed jazz musicians in all of Canada that has included becoming a lawyer, then getting a PhD in French, which he used to become a full-time college French professor, and then incredibly, after 10 years off from playing, picking it back up and becoming a powerhouse in the Toronto music scene. He also discusses being irreplaceable, having your own musical voice, and how he approaches his incredibly innovative collaborations. He tells us all about it next. Hello and welcome to the Entrepreneurial Musician Podcast. I am your host, Andrew Hitz, and uh, I am very excited about uh, about today's guest. Uh, before I introduce him, uh, I would like to ask you that if you have been enjoying uh, what you're hearing, uh, if you could go to iTunes and uh, leave a uh, a rating. And uh, if you had a, a, a second or two on top of that, if you could leave a quick review, um, it would be very helpful. A number of you already have done that. I thank you so much. Uh, that, that helps other people to uh, to find the podcast, and that's going to help me get advertisers and make the millions of dollars so that I can just go away and never be seen from ever again. Uh, not quite, no, but it would be very, very appreciated if you could take the time to do that. And uh, if not, I'm just really happy that you are listening. So um, without further ado, uh, the uh, the guest for uh, this episode of The Entrepreneurial Musician is uh, Ron Davis, who is a, uh, a classically trained jazz pianist and composer um, who is uh, based out of uh, Toronto, Canada. So how are you doing, Ron? Go Blue Jays. Yeah, go. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'm they doing did. good. They didn't have a good start last night, but uh, but yeah, the uh, Toronto's in the playoffs for the first time in I think twenty two years. So that's that's pretty exciting. That's right. It's kind of like my jazz solos, you know. They you know they deceptively start off with a, a you know weekly, but by the time we get to the second and third game, just knock it out of the ballpark. Yeah. <laughs> so so if you ever if you ever see Ron perform, you just have to be patient. So yeah, you can go to the bathroom during the first sixty four bars and then come back, and that's when things start to get cooking. <laughs> That's it. Talk amongst yourselves, folks. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I am. Uh, I'm born and raised in Boston, so um, our uh, our teams are, are are looking at each other uh, from opposite ends of the division from the American League East this year. The uh, Red Sox had a little bit of a uh, little bit of a down year, just like the year before. So, uh, but we will not talk about that because um, poor uh, Buddy Deschler and Austin Boyer, our producers, will be uh, bleeping a lot of words out if I uh, start talking about the 2014 baseball season. So. Um, anyway, uh, I'm sure everyone tuned in to hear you and I talk about baseball. So, uh, maybe not if that could help them make money and, uh, be fulfilled artistically in the music business, then I'm sure they'd be game, but I'm not sure if we can connect those dots. Well, from an entrepreneurial perspective, if we examine the revenue streams in baseball and the revenue streams in music, I don't know. The <laughs> one in baseball is looking pretty good to me at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's 9.15 a.m. It's a little early to be that depressed, so... Yeah. Um, the, uh, although I will say, uh, as a side, you know, when, when people say that, um, you know, that athletes are, are overpaid, um, you know, I, I frequently say that if I were the, uh, if I were the superstar, which is funny being a tuba player, but uh, just work with me for a second. If I was a superstar <laughs> of like a, of a 25 uh, person ensemble and, um, and we could sell, uh, you know, 30, to 35,000 tickets at those prices 81 times a year, uh, then I would also, uh, I would not be happy with uh, $300,000 a year, which would be, that's a lot of money, right? Yeah, but uh, but the money's got to go somewhere. So, uh, but anyway, so that's kind of my my defense of, uh, of athletes. And it's sad that we value that uh, that much more than teachers and a lot of other more important things. But, uh, but the money comes from somewhere and it's got to go somewhere. I agree, and 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 just to get us back on the rails, having gone off so soon, <laughs> my fault entirely. Um, uh, there is actually a huge arts entrepreneurial lesson, in my opinion, to be learned uh, uh, from baseball and other sports. And and I think you hit the nail on the head. Look look at what those teams do. Um, Eighty or a hundred or seventy times a year, they get twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand people uh, into one place to buy their product at prices that we as musicians can only dream of $100 yep. a ticket, you know, 200, maybe there's a $50 ticket and and 
you know, most of us are, are obsessing over $10, $20 ticket charges. Right. And so I actually often do think of sports. And, yeah, there are the million-dollar salaries, but that's the point zero zero one percent just as – there are the million, do- well, not million dollar, but the five figure concert fees amongst uh, uh, many musicians, not to mention the bigger fees amongst rock, rock musicians. That's the point zero zero one percent. But man, if I as a jazz musician or you as a classical or crossover, if you don't mind me using that word, mm-hmm. musician can take a lesson out of baseball and, and, and do whatever it is they're doing to create that zhuzh that gets people in the door. Uh, we could learn a lot because the bottom line is this, and I, I got to believe that this is what underlies your entire enterprise and podcast, Drew, and that is that there, there is a lot of money, there is a lot of revenue in the music business, and our interest, not from a greedy point of view, but from a, uh, um, a survival point of view, is to tap into it. Yeah, I, amen. That's uh... – that answer right there. That's exactly why I have you on the podcast. So, um, and I, I, I better I better get off now. Yeah, that, I think I, thank you. Yeah, we're going to skip the five now, questions. It's yeah, exactly. You've 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 peaked too soon. It's the opposite of your jazz solos. Um, yeah, the the uh, Ron and I were um, were talking before. We've been friends for a few years now, and uh, we were talking before that we hit record. And um, you know, we were we were I was. Uh, going over what I was going to be asking him about, et cetera. And, um, you know, and I told him that uh, one of the things which I will get to is uh, that he's done some incredibly, um, like, really innovative and uh, uh, programming, very innovative and, and creative programming uh, and collaborations and uh, some, some really great stuff over the last few years. Uh, and, um, and I told him that, it, that it's been my observation that there are far more people in the music business who can play the piano like he does or the tuba like I do um, or their instrument uh, like we do. Um, there are far more of those than there are people who are being as innovative as, as Ron is in terms of programming, et cetera. And that's kind of why... That's why we're. That's why I'm doing this podcast. Is because um, you wouldn't be on here if you weren't a, a phenomenal uh, a piano operator and musician. You know, to kind of form an you know a, being an artist. Um, however, uh, that's just that's the barrier uh, requirement to entry. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, for the most part, I guess we could get real cynical about really bad pop music where you just have to be better looking than either of us. But in terms of, uh, you know, our corner of the industry, you got to be good at piano if you're going to be a professional pianist. Um, but then it's like, OK, well, then what else are you going to do? And that's how we got to tap in. So to in terms of the baseball analogy and all of that. So. Um, so yeah, we've gone completely off the rails, but it's now an on topic off the rails, which is good. So I, I thank you for that, for bringing us back. So, um, it's, so, it so rarely happens. Yeah, no, I, that, that With is, me. that is once in a row. So, um, so, uh, Ron, why don't you, um, Ron has a fascinating story. Um, his story in a lot, I mean, none of it is the same. Uh, none of the details are, there's no overlap, but your uh, story reminds me, uh, in some ways, of uh, of Brian Pirtle, who was the, who's the dean of the Lawrence Conservatory, who I had on as a um, as a guest. Um, I don't know, maybe uh, half a dozen episodes ago or so, and uh, or maybe a little bit more. But he um, he ended up uh, he was a trombone player in college, and then he ended up becoming um, an ethnomusicologist who uh, went to the Pacific Rim and was studying didgeridoos, things like that. He then he then went to, and. Uh, worked at Microsoft uh, when they were putting out their Encarta Encyclopedia, um, they hired, they had nine full-time ethnomusicologists on staff, and he was one of those, and he then went and became a dean of the Lawrence Conservatory of Music. So it's just kind of like a completely wacky, like, if that's a screenplay, it's not going anywhere, because that's just, that doesn't happen, you know? Um, And you have a very similar story to that, where it's just like, I'm not really sure how the dots connect, and yet here you are. So can you tell us um, the the unorthodox path that you've taken to get where you are uh, in the music business? And I'll I'll, uh, interject with some uh, incredibly insightful and inspiring questions uh, along the way. Or, or you can just interject with the uh, uh, best the hits from the burp soundboard that I assume <laughs> yeah. you have. On oh, your a- absolutely. We we had that uh, afterwards. Yeah, I I, li- I like the guests to have the illusion that everything is uh, you know is serious. So, 
Well, I, I would say that the interesting difference uh, among many between uh, Brian and me is that Brian uh, took two of the most uh, uh, unorthodox and let's uh, say gener uh, charitably um, uh, low job prospect uh, 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 paths, i.e. bass trombone and ethnomusicology, <laughs> right. and ended up with a hugely legitimate uh, job with a salary, I assume. If you, um, and if you, to already interrupt you, if you have not heard that episode, check it out because he is the real deal. He's a visionary. Like, he, he gets it. We need that kind of guy running every single school uh, in the world, every music school to bring us into the, uh, into the 21st century. I became a super fan within an hour, so he's awesome. So anyway, more well, about uh, Ron. I, so I do have a backlog on my podcast to listen to. I, w I will listen, and just to put it out there, I'm totally prepared to assume the role of visionary with a salary. Um, uh, the um, in my case, I uh, I ended up uh, taking two uh, traditionally high employment uh, paths, uh, and 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 to this day, I I still look around for a regular salary, but I'm I'm not unhappy for having done it. I'm just not as uh, wealthy as I might have otherwise been. So so to answer your question directly, Drew. Um, I, uh, I mean, I began playing, you know, music, you know, when I was seven or eight, as we all did. And, and by 17, I, I, or 15, sorry, 15 or 16, I was already doing professional jazz gigs. Uh, I'd left my classical training behind. Not entirely true. Uh, I, I, my, my jazz teacher who studied with Oscar Peterson, uh, also studied with the great American pianist, um, uh, uh, David Saperton. And so classical was always a thread in my training. Uh, but I, I was going to jazz, and I was a professional player. But um, I had uh, impoverished immigrant parents who were never going to see their kid not go to uh, college. And so I ended up getting an undergraduate degree in French. But the great thing about undergrad is it gave me all that time to practice piano and to do gigs. <laughs> so I, I, was, I was a gigging musician. But the, uh, rubber, when the rubber hit the road, uh, my, uh, my parents, who had a great influence, weren't about to let me become a professional musician. <laughs> so I ended up in law school. Um, and, and, and the great thing about law school is it also gave me a lot of time to uh, practice. But uh, when I came out, um, I was kind of on that path and became a lawyer. And I, I dropped professional piano at that point. Um, I hated law. No, no offense to any of my and your uh, law colleagues there, Drew. But it, it kind of wasn't for me. Uh, and so after two years, I got out. And um, uh, but I was out of music at that point. And, you know, if you're out of music for a year professionally, starting to do gigs is 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 not easy. I can only imagine. So, yeah. Uh, and, and, and but I always had an interest uh, in, in, in kind of philosophy and language. So I went on and did a Ph.D. in French linguistics. Um, my area of, of, of study were time and meaning. And uh, I could spend a lot of time perhaps not much meaning, discussing those two topics. Uh, and, well, and yes, I, became... I received a Ph.D. in time and meaning. <laughs> that doesn't even sound real. Well, you know, sometimes it doesn't, but at least it allows me to tell people I did my Ph.D. on time. <laughs> oh, geez. Groan. Yeah, groan. Get that soundboard out. <laughs> And I might bleep, I might bleep out that joke as if it was a as if it was a bad word. <laughs> oh, well, I, well, listen. Thank you for even raising to the status of a joke. But, uh, um, I, 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 uh, I, 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 not liking law, I thought, well, maybe I'll I'll become a French professor. Um, so I became an assistant professor of French at the University of Toronto. Uh, and uh, only to discover <laughs> that I liked a, a life in academia even less than I liked a life in law, which hmm. is a whole other. No, and again, no offense to my academic colleagues. Sure. Um, and uh, and and it was only after that we're talking the late '90s that I resumed my my career in music as a jazz pianist. And uh, uh, I'd like to have this in for the listeners at that point. I had actually not touched a piano for 10 years. Wow. Uh, literally hadn't played, never mind, not gigging. Huh. And, and my, the resumption of music was kind of gradual. It was running into a jazz musician, telling him I used to be one. He said, why don't we jam? So we jammed, and he said, why don't we jam again? And we jammed again. That became 
it led to a coffee house gig, which led to another coffee house gig, which became a hotel gig. And then a few years down the road, I kind of woke up and say, gee, I guess I'm a musician again. Wow. So, yeah, so that that's what I'm talking about. I mean, you 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 went to law. It's one thing if you go to law school and you then figure out that law isn't for you. So as as many people do, because uh, it, it's a lot of work, they drop out of law school. Uh, but you finished law school and then you passed the bar and then you became a lawyer and then you and then you stopped and then you got a Ph.D. in French and then you became a French professor and then you didn't like that. And uh, um, I so I uh, I alternate between um, between interviews and then uh, T.E.M. short, as I call them, which is just like me talking about the the guest from the interview before, just like kind of a five minute riff off of one of the headlines. And um, ironically, I just before we got on the line, I recorded the one that's uh, going to be coming out the week before yours, which was in reaction to Lance's. And um, this is uh, not for all of them, but there's a number of guests that kind of fall under this that um, Lance's and your story remind me of uh, Seth Godin, who's my favorite author oh, by far. Love Seth who, Godin, yeah. Who my, my wife has started to refer to as my spirit animal um, because <laughs> I because I quote him so often on the podcast and at the dinner table. And um, I think she feels she, she could probably claim that she's read all of his books at this point just by listening to me uh butcher the you know synopses of them um but uh is that the plural of synopsis synopsis I'm, I'm good with synopses all right good yeah i was like i, I was like oh, the, if i pull that off that's good but if that's wrong i'm gonna sound like a real you know what so um, uh, what would synopsis is yeah well like? there is that so um but i just read the dip uh by him which is uh all about identifying whether you're on a, a path that you should continue on and and how it's like the only option at times is to quit. And if you figure out that you're on a cul-de-sac or on a cliff and Lance was in the air force band, which as a euphonium player dream gig uh, and he quit. And then he joined the river city brass band and that for a while was a dream gig, but then it was a cul-de-sac. Then he quit. Then he was in Boston brass for a while. That was a dream gig. Then it was a cul-de-sac. Then he quit. And it takes a lot of courage, I think to, to quit when you're a lawyer, you've already done the hard work at this point. And I know that, we, we, I think musicians, we think that all lawyers, you know, make six, seven hundred thousand dollars a year, and that that's not. You don't just go straight from law school to uh, the bar exam, passing that to being a partner somewhere. Uh, you know, that's uh, there's decades of toil in there, but uh, but that's a pretty safe income if you keep doing that. It takes courage, and then you did it again with academia, which is just which is just awesome. So the parallels uh, between your two interviews already are great. Well, uh, one one thing that that uh, I'd love to plug into kind of the TN vibe. Uh, from, from from what you just said, uh, is that uh, when I when I made the first leap out of law, so this is way before any of, you know your time. Uh, it was 1986, and and um, uh, nobody was doing that at the time. Uh, neither men nor women. Uh, since that time, especially with women, at least up here in Canada, with the the, the ideas of mat leave and the ideas of flexible hours. Um, uh, I, I often joke that I was a pioneer in, in women's issues in employment, uh, but but and 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 there's a half truth to that in the sense that if you were a lawyer, you were a lawyer back then. Right. And um, uh, and and I must admit, it did take courage, and and the amount of pressure on me not to do it, like that, I'd either get the response like. What you're a lawyer? How can what? What, what? Right. you're going? You're going to what? Or people who would say, you know, are you crazy? Uh, and a lot of family pressure. But we're blessed to live in a time, you know, jump cut to uh, thirty years later. We're blessed to live in a time when, if you do it, uh, at least social norms have expanded to uh, make it uh, not unacceptable. And the other thing is, is, is. I think if I had continued in law, uh, I'd, I'd be a withered old prune by now, and um, uh, and never mind the unhappiness. Uh, it, it, it would have been just uh, in a for me, just speaking personally, a waste of life. So if if there are people out there, if there are listeners out there who are kind of at this you know crossroads, um, um, I, I hope you'll seriously consider taking the leap i, I mean I, I gave up for sure a, a decent income stream i uh, i technically drew I'm, I'm still a lawyer i still have my license and instead of waiting tables or, or doing guest lecturing uh, sometimes i do some ghost writing for lawyers i write legal briefs oh. uh, uh, you know without without signing them right. so uh, um uh it, it helps kind of pay a few bills 
but I often think that the the amount of income that I've foregone is 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 crazy. This music career has cost me millions of dollars <laughs> that I could have made, but but the universe has always delivered. Since 1986, I've had a roof over my head. I've had food to eat, and uh, yeah, you know, from times been a bit of an income struggle, but. But um, uh, I'm, I, I never look back at having made the leap, and, and I hope that listeners who, are, who have that you know, fire about music and they have that idea or that thing that they just got to do, just do it. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's uh, not that long ago that um, that someone like someone like my father, um, you know, who worked for uh, the same company for a few decades, um, and he was very fulfilled there. But in general, um, if you were an electrical engineer and you got a job at the Digital Equipment Corporation like he did, then you were there. The company name changed a couple times because there were mergers, uh, you know, at the end. But you know, you you worked there, and then you got a gold watch. And uh, you know, when you were done and you were retired, and that was it. And now, even in the non-musical uh, world, um, I, I can't remember what the average is. Something like the average person only stays in a job. Like the average person, meaning someone like my father, who was in management at a you know at a uh, at a at a computer company. Um, you know that that they they only stay for like seven years or something like that. So the average person is like working at at six different companies. Um, you know, throughout their life, and that's an executive who's uh, you know who's. Um, uh, a, a white collar worker, if you will, not someone who is uh, negotiating. Pay me this much to be there on this day with my piano, or or this that. Yeah. You know, we're we're um, you know largely per service, but um, that's it's pretty fascinating how fast times have changed. And you're a great example of a of a you know the the portfolio musician as it's uh, as a lot of people call it these days. Which you know you have a um, which is what I've uh, post Boston Brass, what I've kind of modeled my career after, which is just attempting to make a little bit of money from a whole bunch of different directions. And then that adds up to um, the whole uh, roof over your head and food to eat thing, uh, which we're not saying uh, flippantly. That's, uh, that's very important. You know, you got to, otherwise it's oh, a hobby. Yeah. Yeah, it's a hobby. Yeah, if you can't do that's that. That's survival, man. Yep. That's, that's like one oh one. And, yep. and, and, and we, we do live in the age. I mean, I, I've been heartened to see that in the U S election campaign, this is already becoming an issue. Uh, in a positive sense, people are talking about it. We live in a gig economy. There are no more jobs. There are only gigs. Right. And and to really turn things on their head, that's where we musicians kind of have a leg up. Right. Because if you're a, if if you're an engineer at, at DEC or whatever the company mm-hmm. comes to be called, it's like ah, oh, you know, I, I I thought I had a nine to fiver here. Right. Uh, with an iron rice bowl. Yeah. But no, it's gigs, and and if there's one thing we musicians know how to do is is to live in a gig economy. Right. And you're doing it, and you know Lance is doing it, and and all of our colleagues are doing it. Yeah, that's that's very true. So, uh, so let's go. So you so you jammed with this guy, and then you jammed again, and then you jammed some more, and then uh, I can't. That's hard. I mean, that's a hard thing to do when you're when you're 22 and you just graduated from college, um, but uh, but when you're a, a lawyer. Lawyer, and you know, it's like there's just so many layers to that that are, are just kind of that you can kind of think about for a while. It's it's awesome that you had the courage to do that. Um, how did um, you know? Can you start back up with the story that I interrupted uh, in terms of just like you start there and then that moves forward? Um, you know, how did you how did you get the footing from just going from the coffee shop thing to moving forward? Well, you know. Uh, uh, if you, you you talk about courage. I I, I look at it as a, a blissful uh, idiocy on my part uh, <laughs> by way fine, of ignorance. Fine line, right? There uh, really I, is. Yeah. I tell you, uh, 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 fools seldom venture where something something. Anyway, <laughs> I'll I'll have now. To, I'm being ignorant. Again. I'll have to. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, can, can, exhibit A. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, well, this I think to answer your question really I gets to the heart of, of the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, what I realized is, is what I think is the golden rule of, of being a professional musician. And you and I were kind of alluding to this when we were offline. Talent is the least part of it. Actually, you alluded to it when we were online at the front end of this right. podcast. Talent is the least part of it. Yes, if, it is. Um, uh, if you're in the music business, be prepared to be in the music business. Right. <laughs> and and uh, I was kind of shocked because, um, uh, especially with with my, my training, you know, 
getting scales note perfect, getting, you know, touch on the piano even, uh, it, it, having my dynamics down. It, it was my, my obsession. And then you get out there. And, uh, of course, your colleague musicians worry about that. But if I was going to go from a coffee house gig to something more steady or get more work, it was I was not going to be able to phone up someone and say, you should hear me play my E flat major 13th. I'm telling you, I've got that. I've got so many inversions of that down or my deep up scales. Dude, you just hired me for that alone. You know, I'll come out for a thousand bucks and show you my bebop scales. Oddly enough, that wasn't working, Drew. <laughs> That's kind of like a lawyer bragging about how they are able to write incomplete sentences. Yeah, uh, it's like it's kind of takes. I can do that. It does not mean that I'm uh, that I'm prepared to be ghostwriting legal briefs. <laughs> I think. Yes. Yeah. Although, if there were lawyers who could, I can make all the lawyers. <laughs> <that's all. laughs> if there were lawyers who write complete sentences. I would be out of that. Yeah. My ghostwriting gig. So fair enough. They they can't. And hello, lawyer friends. Uh, <laughs> happy to slag it. Um. <laughs> So, 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 um, uh, and, 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 and of course, you know, uh, success is that grand mix of, uh, ability, opportunity and, and, and luck. And then luck of course is, uh, what is it? Uh, preparation meets opportunity. Right. And, and so, um, uh, even the ca cafe gig was just, uh, it happened to be a cafe where I frequented and I was talking to the owner and, you know, do you ever have music? And they said no, and I said, "Well, uh, I'd love to provide some." And uh, and he said yes, uh, and that led to a hotel gig. Uh, I I don't know what it's like uh, down your way now uh, in, in Washington or back home in Boston for you, Drew. But hotel gigs, which used to be plentiful, have now pretty much dried up. Um, I would I, I'm not in that scene, but I would guess that that is the case here as well. Yep. They were lucrative. I mean, you, had, you know, three, four, five days uh, a week, right. you know, with a regular paycheck. Uh, but uh, uh, this was uh, in the 90s, and um, uh, a, a new uh, schmancy hotel was opening up. And uh, I saw they had a piano, and I said, do you need a piano player? Uh, uh, and, and to my shock, they said yes. And I, I landed a gig, and it was only ended up being four months, but it was four months, four nights a week. Uh, three hours with a steady paycheck, and um, uh, what what that made me realize is that kind of sounds almost not naive, but I'm sure Seth Godin would smile uh, uh, happily on this. It's you got to learn to ask, um, and you got to learn to sell. Sales is such a huge part of what we do. Yes. So not only asking, like selling, saying, "Hey, I have a widget for you," or "I have a." comb for you or or you know you have a bit of body odor i have antiperspirant that you need to buy <laughs> not that i'm comparing my music career to antiperspirant but <laughs> yeah if you're i tell musicians all the time um that uh, you know if i am doing consulting work or speaking with my students uh which i try to impart you know a bunch of non-musical um wisdom through my successes and more importantly my failures in the music business to so try and give them a few shortcuts but uh, if you're not comfortable selling yourself, then uh, then you need to uh, you are on a cul-de-sac and you need to quit immediately. <laughs> you know, yeah. and uh, well, rather you either need to get comfortable with it, and that doesn't mean love it. It doesn't mean that you need to become passionate about trying to get people to hire you. But if you're horrible at it and you don't like it, and you are okay with simply declaring, it's like sight reading. Classical musicians, uh, you know, there's I can't tell you how many students I've met who just say. I'm not, um, yeah, I'm not very good at sight reading. So I then say, you know, well, do you, do you practice sight reading every single day? And then they kind of look at me like, huh. <laughs> so, you know, it's like if you're in music school, knock on the clarinet player's door next to you if you're a tuba player and ask them very nicely if you can take a book to the other side of that wall for five minutes. And before you open it up and find a nice key, just like decide that in this etude book, you're going to play number six. <laughs> and then you open it up. Give yourself 30 seconds to read it and go, you know, and then do it. And if you want to record it and get hardcore or whatever, but yeah, if you, if you can't sell yourself, then you're, then you'd better be practicing for one of those, uh, you know, super steady gigs, more steady than a hotel gig as in like the air force band or the Toronto symphony or one of those. And as long as they're around and, you know, and solvent, et cetera, then you'll be good. Uh, but man, that is such an important point that you just made. 
Well, uh, you know, and let me give you a little Canadian perspective. Uh, you know, um, you know, there's the old joke that every Canadian gets, that not every American gets, is you know, what's the easiest way to get an apology out of a Canadian? Step on their foot, <laughs> and 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 you know, uh, the culture up here is very much a self-effacing, in general, self-effacing culture, and that 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 um, uh, uh, trickles down into music. Uh, uh, we have some amazing musicians and in my home city of toronto especially at the moment it's a golden age of especially jazz musicians but other musicians as well and one of the things we love about our american colleagues and i often say this among jazz uh, you know, jazz musicians and i'm talking about jazz colleagues who have like played carnegie hall who have toured with the george shearings or have you know accompanied uh, yo-yo ma um uh, and are still self-effacing one of the reasons american musicians are better than us is because they say they're better than us, <laughs> and 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 um, and and you know it, it's uh, that may be a little home home homegrown baseball for my Canadian colleagues, but for 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 a more general interest, that idea of selling yourself is you're absolutely right, Drew. You don't have to go around saying you're better than someone, but at least you have to have something in your talk and in, in your demeanor that when that person is is, is thinking of hiring you, I, I, sorry, in your talk and your demeanor and in your playing, right? So when that person uh, 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 who you're talking to is going to hire you, or when that person on the other side of the curtain who's auditioning you, is going to listen to you, mm -hmm. there's something extra that says, damn, Drew is like, oh, I don't know what I just heard or or, or who I just heard or that guy Drew, that's the guy I'm going to hire because, you know, he's special. Because otherwise, I don't have to tell you, there are a thousand graduates for every one of us uh, uh, every year. And um, I, I'm, I ha I'm a sub you know, supremely self-critical musician. Um, I would redo every single recording I ever did. I would redo every solo I ever did. Sure. But when I'm talking to someone, I figured out a way to, to say why they've got to hire me and got to hire me at a living wage, right. not for a hundred dollars for a three hour wedding gig or right. whatever. <laughs> yeah. The, um, there is a, a book that I will plug that I'm guessing I've mentioned on the podcast before, but it's called uh, book yourself solid by Michael Port. And uh, it is a it's a fabulous book. Um, it talks all about um, all about selling yourself, and um, he starts by breaking down the um, by uh, by by br breaking down meaning like bringing down the the, the kind of the, the old school view of selling. And he he argues that a lot of people are turned off by sales because they imagine the used car salesman who you go to try and you know spend 10 grand and the used car salesman if they can is going to put you into a $24,000 car because they get a higher commission and they don't care about the customer and the customer's needs are just trying to get as many dollars possible as they can out of the customer like in a vacuum of uh not even like bad ethics just like just aggressive you know bulldog selling and um and and his uh you know he 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 talks all about uh about how to sell yourself whether it be online um that uh even that elevator pitches don't really exist anymore it's a, it's a fascinating book and it will um i think it certainly challenged some of my preconceptions about sales um and i'm not a salesman but i'm also not averse to it you know and i know some people are super and there's some things that you are and that i are like super so i am uh, super averse to sales is not necessarily one of them but this absolutely made me kind of make my message more concise and to kind of think of it differently. I've put in, you put in all that work on those, uh, the E flat major 13th, uh, you know, chord, uh, et cetera. And, and, and you have to do that work in order to be able to play like you do. But so, um, if you feel that your piano playing is going to, um, improve the concert series you're trying to get on, it's going to improve the lives of the people that hear it. Uh, then you know you're you're not trying to pull a fast one over on them. You're just they're not going to just come to you. That hotel is not going to. Uh, you're not in the hotel's Rolodex. <laughs> Even if you were, there's a, if there's 400 names in there, they're not just going to spin it. And it's all of a sudden it's like uh, Ron Davis says he plays piano. Hey, we've got a new luxury. You made that happen. You hear that guest after guest after guest on this podcast where people took the initiative and get shot down and shot down and shot down and then not shot down <laughs> and then shot down and shot down and then not shot down. So that, oh, that's a great we've lesson. all had those failures. You know, Robert Redford made us, 
I'm assuming everyone knows who Robert Redford is, you know, yes. won a ton of Academy Awards, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but he, he made a speech recently, uh, recently, like in the past two years, saying, um, I'm Robert Redford. I've won Academy Awards. I've made movies with Paul Newman. You know, I've made some of the most uh, well-known movies. And yet, every time I have a new project, I have to go into that room and tell people why they should invest in it. And I get the door slammed in my face more often than I get said yes to. And that's, and I'm sure, you know, uh, uh, many artists of, of renown have, have that story. And, and, you know, we all learn strategies. And, and uh, if I can you know, um, kind of just nudge up to one of the other topics you and I were discussing doing that is my, my projects and my yeah. varied projects. Um, uh, in my own case, uh, I, I learned two strategies that are absolutely key and that keep me alive in this business. The first strategy is to ask questions when, when you're talking to a potential uh, client or your potential booker or, 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 a, 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 a artistic director, um, uh, ask, ask a few questions. I mean, um, of course, if you're talking to someone who has no interest in music or in hiring a tuba player or in hiring a, a pianist, you're wasting your time. Right. But if there's a spark of interest, um, then you owe it to yourself, you owe it to your career like to start asking some questions. In, in my case, for example, if I hear of a, um, uh, of a, uh, uh, a lecture series, a TED, a TED Talks like lecture series, I, I just met someone last night. And so I knew that they do music. So I said, oh, you know, what kind of music you've been presenting? What venues are you presenting it in? Um, what kind of acts have you been booking? And I realized right away is that uh, the type of project I'm doing with uh, – the, the type of work I'm doing with my project called Symphronica, where I bring in either Japanese taiko drummers or Don't Be Shocked Drew, Brass Quintets, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and the like – we're perfect for this lecture talk series that she's doing. And uh, uh, we adjourned at that point, and this woman and I are going to talk later. But I, I learned some, some uh, uh, information that uh, seemed to be appropriate. So the first big lesson I learned was to ask questions. And I'm going to have more questions of this woman. You know, how many tickets do they usually sell? What are the price ranges? And that will allow me to price – to, you know, to price my project if she's going to book me appropriately. If, if they're used to selling 100 tickets for $5 each, I'm not going to demand a $10,000 fee. Right. Uh, but on the other hand, if they're used to selling 500 tickets for $100 to $200 each, you know, then I, I can ask for a bigger fee. It makes me think there's a musician here in Toronto, fabulous musician, really gifted, has carved out a niche for himself in a particular area of um, world music. But he does not leave his house for under $3,000. That's it. And he's great, but he works three times a year. Right. You know, and, and, and he's into that. And he's good, and his, his spouse has a job, so he has a roof over his head and food every day. There you go. Uh, the, the other lesson, by the way, I learned is that I've learned not to make it about me. If you're one of those musicians who says, I am the, like, that greatest piano player that has walked the face of this earth and you need to hire me. And if you can get that across without being a D bag, um, <laughs> then great. You're going to be great in sales. Right. Um, on the other hand, if you're like me and I think many of our colleagues drew who are pretty, you know, as I say, self-critical or, uh, or, or, or know that there's to quote Pablo Casals when he was 92 years old, when asked why he still practices, he said, because I'm still making progress. Yeah. I love if, that if, quote. Yeah. If we're, if we're in that camp, then I, I don't focus on, on, on me and my ego. I focus on my project. Right. And, and for example, with this woman, with the lecture series, with the talk series, it's like, I think my project is good for you. I don't know if I'm great, but my musicians are great. And I think we'll fit in, and that if we if we do request a a a, a appropriate fee from you, it won't it will be money well spent, and we can deliver because I believe in the project. Well, and you also um, just nailed another key to selling yourself or your project or anything, which is that um, again the, the the polar opposite of the stereotypical. I like to say stereotypical. There are plenty of used car salesmen that are just as honest as you and I, and there always have been. But the stereotypical used car salesman, you know, the opposite of that, which is that you are asking this woman questions about what she needs, and because um, you know, chances are, if she's got a series like that, 
even if she runs it, she's got other people to, uh, you know, she either has a board that she reports to or she has a boss or she uh, there's a department budget or whatever. I mean, it, there's there's almost it's almost never just one human being with a space that owns the space and pays the right. the fee and all that. So so this woman needs to you need to make sure that you are are providing her what she needs. And so you you kind of lead with what you're going to do for them rather than, Hey, this is what you need to do for me. And then when you, and that's, that's how you, that's how sales is supposed to work. Yeah. You don't want to be the bagpiper at the bar mitzvah. No. <laughs> un, un, unless it's a Scottish bar mitzvah. <laughs> that's uh that's really funny. That reminds me nothing to do with, uh, with uh, entrepreneurship, but uh, I saw a, uh, I saw a quote or, or a clip um, the other day of uh, this was someone I think it was in Glasgow. Uh, there was a, a a nut job who was uh, standing um, on the on a busy street corner with a little amplifier, and uh, I won't even get into the subject matter, but he was spewing just incredibly hateful, like awful stuff, which I'm glad you're able to do in Scotland and here. But, uh, but I'm also glad that you're able to do what some young man did, which, um, this guy was just, I mean, the, his voice was bouncing off of the buildings. It was so loud. And, um, one guy, uh, went into his apartment and grabbed his bagpipes and then walked outside <laughs> and then started, <laughs> started walking in circles around the guy. And it was so loud that it completely drowned the guy out. And he then was just standing two feet in front of him facing this guy spewing this hate and drowning him out with bagpipes and that's when the cops came and did arrest the guy because i don't think he had a permit and whatever you know but uh it was right. it was it was hilarious so um Chew the bagpipe jokes yeah ex- exactly it was it was it was awesome so it was back and, bagpipe and, and, justice and, and and let's make uh, uh, just so that we honor our your bagpipe uh, uh bagpiper uh listeners there um uh drew let's let's give honor to rufus harley who, as you know, is the great jazz bagpiper uh, with several recordings to his name. I don't so, think I'd, I've never heard of him. I got to check Rufus that out. Rufus Harley, my, Scott uh, Soul. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> my uh, my mother's maiden name is Baird, so uh, I'm, I've got some Scottish in me. So I'll, I'll have to check that out. Represent. Yeah, there you go. So um, okay, so let's uh, let's go ahead and talk about the um, about the the collaborations, which um, as I think the audience is going to agree with me when you uh, you know when you just hear about them, they're going to pique your interest. Um, and, uh, you know, from, from an artistic standpoint, but, uh, oh, by the way, it's also, uh, it's a heck of a lot easier for a presenter to, um, to book, to sell tickets to something that, uh, you don't have to be a musician to find some of the collaborations that you are doing interesting. Um, you know, so it's not, um, it's the whole, uh, uh blue ocean strategies thing, you know, rather than, uh, you know, red ocean is a jazz combo, you know, that, that has a saxophone and a piano and a bass and drums. And, uh, I'm very glad that that exists and I don't want it to go anywhere, um, because they're all different, but your average customer isn't necessarily going to understand how you and, uh, say the other, you know, the other two top, uh, you know, jazz pianists in Toronto, uh, I'm sure that you all have, you all have your own styles and you all have, you know, you all play differently. Um, and, um, but, but like you said, inside baseball, that's inside baseball to the average consumer, you know? Um, and so it can be hard to, for someone to sell that, but if you have the collaborations that you were talking about, um, I'm sure I'll, I, I won't speak for you, but I'm guessing it's incredibly artistically rewarding. Um, it certainly was with some of the more off the wall ones we did with Boston Brass, and it's also easy to sell uh, to a space, uh, tickets, etc. So you're kind of thinking about the end user um, as well. So can you tell us about some of the collaboration you've done and how you started going down that road in the first place? Sure. So and and so we're talking about. Uh, what I've framed as my project called Symphronica. I kind of stuck myself in the middle of a symphony, so right. Symphronica. And um, kind of the, 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 what, what led me to that is, is what you were saying about, you know, the other jazz pianists. And by the way, Toronto being Toronto, it's a hugely strong jazz. And in fact, I, I often say that Toronto at this moment, uh, there's no better jazz city in the world. I think, you know, there's New York, there's Toronto, uh, there's some, Great stuff coming out of Chicago, L.A., uh, and some European cities. Uh, we're, I think we're all tied for first place there. And um, so there's a, a lot of, I don't want to say competition, but there, is, there are a lot of jazz pianists, you know, who can, 
who can pull their weight uh, up here. And if I can use a lawyerly word, uh, it's uh, fungible. I don't know if you know the word fungible. I know but... it, but I can't tell you what it means. So I can't, <laughs> so meaning I've heard of it. And it's so much fun to say. Yeah. <laughs> that it is. Right? <laughs> Drew, you're looking very fungible today. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> Actually, you are not fungible, Drew, because you are one of a kind. And that's exactly the, uh, well, you know, the opposite, the antonym of fungible. Fungible means is when you can replace one thing with another. So if I, the classic example is, you know, a nail. Um, if I have a nail and it falls on the ground, you may give me a nail uh, and it's just like the other nail, it's fungible. Right. Now, I'm not going to go so far as to say that musicians are fungible, uh, but in jazz, as in classical, you know, you really have to go a long way to persuade me why your, um, uh, you know, your, your, your emperor concerto, why your version of A Night in Tunisia is is much greater than another person's. And, and that's musician to musician. Uh, to the general public, sad but true, we are fungible. So you have to differentiate yourself. Um, and and uh, I didn't do this to differentiate myself. I didn't do Symphronica to differentiate. I did it because um, uh, I realized that, yeah, my version of, of A Night in Tunisia is the best possible version I could do, and I love it. But there are other versions and, you know, people may not be into that. Uh, so I love classical music. I listen to more classical than I do to jazz. And it started like with me saying, I wish I could do both together. I'd love that. And I actually made a recording called Shimmering Rhythm in 2006, which was the start of this. And, and it got a good reception. It was my jazz quartet, sorry, my jazz trio with uh, viola, cello, and two clarinets. Um, mm. uh, even there, a non-traditional classical ensemble, yeah. uh, and all those people could could interact. And then that led me down to other roads. Um, uh, I, I I I realized that uh, I could uh, uh, make that ensemble kind of um, uh, a fixed ensemble, uh, and so now it's it's morphed into a jazz quartet, but an electric acoustic jazz quartet. So I play electric keys and, and acoustic piano sometime at the same time. I have electric guitarist, I have an uh, acoustic and electric bassist, and then a drummer, and a standard string quartet. And and first of all, the, the sonorities that are available to me are non-traditional. So from a musical point of view, there's all sorts of stuff I can do. So if you go online uh, to my YouTube channel, uh, there's a version of Poker Face. Um, actually, right. I call it Variations and Fugue on Poker Face because I don't want to get sued by Lady Gaga because uh, <laughs> I just take themes from there. Right. And, there, you know, there's, there's uh, acoustic piano, electric piano, and string quartet, and, and electric guitar kind of thrashing on, um, uh, on themes from Poker Face. And then in the middle is uh, like about 128-bar four-voice fugue that I've written for string quartet. And it's a strict – sorry, three-voice fugue that I've written for uh, – no, four-voice four voice fugues, strict four voice fugue that I've written for string quartet. So I can do that without this kind of odd collaboration and kind of, and then from a consumer point of view, uh, first of all, we're doing stuff like poker face, but also visually it's fun. Right. It's fun to look at electric guitarists and the string quartet and, mm -hmm. and that. Um, and so I, I did a residency in Toronto. I, I created a subscription series for Symphronica and I did that for two years with that ensemble uh, and also it allowed me to work with arrangers and bring in new voices. And so I was kind of doing new music, jazz, classical, world, pop, uh, all at once. And I'm doing it, I present it in a space uh, in Toronto is, is kind of renowned for world music um, called the Lula Lounge. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, Toronto has been a home uh, to um, a lot of uh, Latino immigration, but also from Cuba because we haven't had an embargo. So, so we have all this Cuban music, Brazilian music, and here I bring this jazz, classical, pop mashup into, into a world Latino music venue. So right off, the, right off the bat, it was kind of you know, a hoot. And, and it's a challenge. I mean, uh, uh, Toronto is not as much an outgoing city for music as, say, New York or Boston or Chicago. But, um, but right off the top, 
it wasn't the Ron, J Ron Davis trio or quartet where you're going to hear, you know, Night in Tunisia or, or Billy's Bounce, you know, or whatever. It was something different, and I, I, I caught a fair bit of media attention. But after two years of doing it with that fixed ensemble, um, I needed to say something else, and I think people wanted to see something different. So a world of opportunity opened up to me when I realized hey, you know, everyone in the arts is just trying to find a voice and a channel. And so um, I have a great friend who is a Japanese taiko drum, well, taiko means drum in Japanese, but a Japanese taiko ensemble master. And uh, his name is Kiyoshi Nagata. And Kiyoshi has this amazing drum ensemble. And um, people know the koto drummers, uh, the big, you know, 10-foot drums that you hit. So the taiko ensemble is close to that. And they come out, you know, men in diapers and women, you know, with the band rolls around their head and, 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 and just playing the drums in this primal way uh, that, you know, that only the Japanese can do. And, and, and I, I did a gig with my octet, string quartet, jazz quartet, and then the four Japanese taiko. And it was just out of the ballpark. And there's also a clip of us doing a piece that I wrote for, uh, for the 12 of us uh, online. Um, called uh, Do Deca Nagata. Do Deca means twelve in Greek, and I wrote the piece in twelve eight. And and you can see you can see us doing it uh, on YouTube. Um, but once I did the thing with the Japanese, I said, "Well, sky's the limit." So I brought in a flamenco guitarist, and 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 we did a, a, a flamenco guitar and and our ensemble. Um, uh, my most recent gig was with an actor. And she uh, she uh, did some. She's a great singer, so we did a few standards. Uh, well, at least songs. They weren't well known jazz standards, but she also recited. She did some readings with some of my ensemble, and one of the reasons she did was she recited some recipes from a Canadian cookbook, and we played along with her, uh, and huh. and that was that was crazy uh, interesting. Wow. Uh, the next. What I'm doing is with a brass ensemble that you introduced me to, Drew, the Hogtown Brass Ensemble. These are legit trained classical players who can do the, you know, Boston brass, uh, uh, um, uh, Canadian brass thing, but they can also blow on jazz changes. So, um, you know, I hope what I'm describing orally describes the richness of the experience. Uh, there's just so much uh, we can do, and it's it's different, but... Um, it's it's a reason for people to come and listen to music because mu music has become a visual art for most people and it's become spectacle. Right. And um, uh, uh, we're, uh, and when I say we, I mean people like you who are classically trained, people like me, we're trying to square the circle and trying to make it interesting for people who have shorter attention spans and need to see smoke, sm you know, smoke and ice shows right. that, that we may not present. And that's what's, you know, kind of a collaboration that I'm trying to do in Symphronica brings forward. Well, and we're, um, you know, I, uh, as a member of Boston Brass, uh, a number of years ago, I went to the, um, the APAP conference, which I think, do I remember that you went to a couple of years ago? Yeah, yeah. Uh, with, with my wife. Yep. Um, and uh, who was a singer and who has uh, a, a Espresso Manifesto, is that right? You have, yep. you have a good memory. Yep. Yep. Daniela yep. Nardi's a special manifesto. Yeah, uh, which which Ron plays with, and and she has a wonderful album, which Ron was a co-producer on. And um, but uh, so you you figure out when you go to this uh, APAP conference, uh, which is every January, I believe, um, in uh, at the the Midtown Hilton in uh, right in the middle of New York City, and um, it is. Uh, it is daunting when you get there and you see that there's like it, it feels like there is a hundred thousand people that you are and it's not that many but it feels like it that you're competing against and uh, we figured out quickly with Boston Brass that we were um, now we of course knew that we weren't just competing against other brass quintets um, but uh, we weren't also just competing against string quartets either um, we were competing against uh, against G Canadian jazz pianists who play with taiko drummers. Uh, we're competing against uh, small traveling Chinese acrobat troops. We're competing against people who uh, play piano parts to silent films. Uh, we, you know, I mean, just kind of you, you know, you, uh, <laughs> you name it. 
Um, and uh, Ron's now playing air piano with uh, moving his mouth without talking. Yeah, just to, so if you're wondering what the heck that that noise was. Um, so you're and and on top of that is that we're all competing against. Um, you know, I've got uh, I've got the uh, the six plus iPhone, which is perfect for me, but it's huge. I can I can watch. I can stream any hockey game, any baseball game, any football game. I can stream my own cable, which has 400 channels, and my own DVR straight from my phone anywhere. Um, and I'm a rabid hockey, baseball, basketball, football, uh, you know, Premier League in in, uh, in England. I mean, just all that stuff. And not that I'm not that I'm more a fan of that than of music. But the point is that for me to get out and to go and to see you, and I can just sit wherever I'm sitting and watch all of that stuff. Um, is uh, working and oh by the way my TV is um, you know if uh, which I just have like a, a standard uh, large HD you know TV but uh, if you wanted this size TV of HD like say 10 years ago this TV would have cost like twelve thousand dollars you know uh, and now uh, and I bought it goodness I bought it four four or five years ago and it was only a thousand dollars then it's probably six hundred dollars now um, and so the point is that we're just we're competing against so much stuff, so it can't just be that. And by the way, uh, in case you thought that Ron was uh, selling himself short, if you listen to him play A Night in Tunisia, you know, I've seen him just play some straight-ahead jazz uh, standards. He's phenomenal at it. I mean, it's it's great, you know, really, really great. Um, but uh, but but yeah, so much more needs to go into all of this, and you figure that out really quickly when you go to a thing like APAP. So it's it's not surprising that you're getting some traction with uh, with this series, and it sounds like it's incredibly uh, rewarding for you creatively as well. I love that you mentioned APAP, uh, Drew, because if there's one pilgrimage I could recommend to every musician to make, even as just a casual attendee, it's to go to APAP to the Hilton in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, in January or to some of the events because it's, it's a great leveler. It's a great equalizer. It's as you say, you see all musicians there and not like, you know, knowns and or sorry, not only unknowns, but plenty of knowns and plenty of people right in the middle kind of have a profile. And you might walk by the downstairs bar and they're going to be showcasing there. There'll be groups who you have every one of their recordings and they're showcasing in a noisy bar for 20 minutes trying to be heard where there are another 20 showcases going upstairs um, uh, f- with with artists who are equally well known, or with this kind of competition from a Michael Jackson tribute that buyers will go to because the name Michael Jackson's associated with it, and then every twenty minutes it's it's uh, 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 lather, rinse, repeat because right. it, it starts over again, and 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 of course everyone has the marketing and everyone has publicity and everyone's working at a world level. So you realize what you're up against. Uh, there's a huge noise to signal ratio uh, that you have to overcome. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I didn't do Symphronica because of that. Um, I haven't done these collaborations because of that. I've done them collaborations because I believe in them and they bring a great deal of joy. Uh, and, you know, when and, and we all experience this, Drew, as I'm sure you know, when, when those moments come when I ask, what am I doing in music? I, I'm out of here. Um, right. I, I, I then think of like, I'm, what I'm doing is this fantastic collaboration with the Tycho drummers or with the Hogtown Brass uh, Quintet, uh, and I recommit to the to the enterprise. And then I realize it's also a differentiating factor. If I go to APAP, you know, there there are going to be um, uh, you know however many great jazz pianists there, um, uh, but I don't think there are going to be too many people with an electric acoustic jazz quartet, a string quartet, and Japanese drummers or brass quartet or, <laughs> sure. or whatever. So at least it'll give me that extra five seconds of mind share and attention uh, to show you what I'm doing. And by the way, but not just by the way, um, on a musical integrity scale, I'll go down with the ship saying that I, I think we, 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 it, we aim for and achieve the highest standards. I'm Canadian. I'm going to say we could always be better. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Uh, um, uh, it's a differentiating factor. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I'm. I'm always. Uh, I'm always uh, harping on my students, you know, or people that I do consulting for. You know, what is your point of differentiation? And uh, if it's simply that you do what has already been done a little better, 
Yes, you can market that. Yes, you can make a living. But man, is that an uphill battle? That's uh, that's that's really hard. So yeah, you... just, and and you know there shouldn't be. But one of the things um, I, I like to share uh, with students is that there shouldn't be any shame attached to it, any um, uh, or any sense of oh that's a sellout. Um, uh, and 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 the way I like to shine a light on that point is think of you know whoever your inspiration is, whoever your great art you know your favorite art artist is. Uh, so in my case, for example, taking two classical examples, um, Vladimir Horowitz and Glenn Gould, their inspirations to me as pianists, as musicians, and people who had uh, careers of the highest integrity. But you know what, um, um, Vladimir Horowitz recorded this, did an arrangement of and recorded this mad version of, of Stars and Stripes Forever. And if you haven't heard it, you got to hear it. I haven't. And it's just sheer virtuoso fireworks. It's crazy how amazing, you know, a piece of virtuosity it is. Um, Glenn Gould recorded two versions of the Goldberg, Ver, Goldberg Variations, not one. 1955 and, both, and 1981. You got it, man. Yeah. And, 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 um, you know, here are guys who could not be accused of sellouts, but but in in the case of of Horowitz's Stars and Stripes and Gould's second version of of um, Goldberg Variations, there was a strong kind of commercial publicity dimension to what they were doing, right. and yet they did it. They did it with integrity. Uh, it was had a lot to do with marketing and sales, and even though, of course, I want to hear Horowitz's Schumann, and of course, I want to hear. Uh, you know Glenn Gould's uh, 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 version of Alban Berg and all the you know more arcane stuff. They had a bit of you know zhuzh to them. They had a bit of uh, pizzazz, and there's nothing wrong with that. So yeah, you may you know you may be able to play um, uh, the the smoothest version of the Hindemith tuba sonata um, in, in 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 history, but man, if you can if you can do um, I don't know. Uh, if you can play, uh, oh, what's what's the name of that uh, dancer who she's just kind of a singer and she's really famous now? And anyway, <laughs> oh boy, doesn't really narrow it. But uh, uh, I don't know if, if if you can play, a, you know, a, a, a Kanye piece on tuba, right? Because you did this killer arrangement. Sure, do it. Yeah, and do it with musical integrity, and right away you've got something to sell, and you've just differentiated yourself. No shame. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, the um, let's see here. The, what last thing I wanted to mention before uh, before we get to the five questions, and I uh, send you uh, on to the rest of your day, uh, is that um, kind of a good microcosm of how um, of how the the music business uh, works is um, that uh, the. Um, the Hogtown Brass, um, who is a brass quintet that I do uh, some uh, some consulting work for, um, that are out of Toronto. Um, I was uh, telling them that um, that they needed to um, that they needed to, uh, to to be in touch with you because uh, you're such a great example of creative programming and um, and you know and and that kind of thing and and just somebody that they could look to for how to handle social media and how to sell themselves, etc. And uh, and so they contacted you and then sure enough you checked out what they were doing and then um and then what do you know the um you know that you guys are collaborating so and they're you know i think it's next month that you guys are playing a concert together and and they're the latest guests on the symphronica series and um and yeah it's that's how the that's how it works like you weren't you weren't googling uh, you know at home you weren't googling like toronto brass quintet that i could collaborate with you know it's just kind of um there's a mutual contact and and it's just kind of it's a it's a good example and oh by the way even if i if i worked with these guys and if they were jerks um there's no way that i would have sent them your way you know um the um the uh, i would have um uh, I would have obviously. I, I would have told them to learn from you, but I would not have told them to. Uh, to <laughs> I would not. I would have told you to steer clear. So yeah, it's very, very, very important. Well, so. well bless you. And that and that actually raises one one point that it's always worth keeping in mind. As much as the arts is a business, it's also personal. Right. And and uh, I I bet you resonate. This resonates with you, and I know it resonates with a lot of my colleagues. That I would much rather play 
with a musician who doesn't quite have that E flat major 13th, you know, down, uh, can do it, but not as well as someone else. Right. But is it's a better human being to play with who I like playing better with. Yes. And that, that personal streak runs all through the arts, you know, whether it's Mozart and his librettists, you know, whether it's, um, uh, uh, you know, Julie Tamor and, who I think is a genius, uh, the, the theater director, and, 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 her, and her collaborators, you know, uh, uh, um, there's, to repeat the phrase, there's no shame in there being a personal dimension to the arts, you know, working with someone, getting a gig just because you know someone, or doing a collaboration because you know someone. And I did need to meet the guys, and once I met the guys in the, brass, in the Hogtown Brass Quintet, um, I actually hadn't heard them yet, other than a few samples online, but I knew I was going to work with them. Right. I knew it. Yep. Uh, and then I heard them, and thank God <laughs> yeah. they can play. <laughs> that would have been. And also, I trusted you, Drew. Yeah, sure. Uh, that's that's really funny. So that's just a good example of uh, yeah, your reputation precedes you, and you just never, um, you know, you, you never know. So, um, all right. So uh, the five questions uh, portion of uh, of the episode, which I'm sure you've been very nervous about because it gets pretty intense. Um, question number one: What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Stay in college and study classical music. Uh, I got that advice when I was 14 years old from uh, one of the founders of jazz and jazz piano. His name is Earl Fava Hines. He was a pianist with Louis Armstrong, Louis Armstrong in the 1920s. And um, jazz piano, uh, 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 I won't say exists because of Earl Fava Hines, but uh, he was one of the founding fathers. And he happened to be in Toronto, and I nervously went up to him. And, um, and here was a man who was probably denied a college education because of his race and um, denied a career in classical music because of his race. But you know, it, that wisdom that he imparted to me uh, was basic. And even though my college degree is not in music, um, everything you do is music. So my French and my French linguistics totally informs the way I play and the choices I make in art. And I feel it gave me a real you know, ground in, in, in the world and in my music career. Uh, and studying classical music, if you study classical, you can play anything. Um, if you don't study classical, you're going you're gonna to struggle your way to get this piece of technique and that piece of technique. Plus, you're missing out on a great tradition. Wow, that's, that's great. Um, number two, what is a mistake that you have made in your career, um, and what did you learn from it? Yes, all of the above. <laughs> Um, uh, I, I, I bet you get this, this often, like, where do, where do I begin? Sure. Um, I, I'm going to give you, uh, a, 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 it sounds like it's kind of a, a very local uh, answer, but it really is a global answer. So my mistake was in, uh, in an important concert I was giving where there was an important manager, um, in, in, I took an intermission and I shouldn't have taken an, an intermission. It broke the flow of the evening, mm -hmm. and I should have done a straight 75 or 90-minute set, right. um, and I lost that, that manager's uh, attention. So, I mean, it's not a huge mistake because of one concert, but what um, it made me focus on and be really aware of in music is that music is more than about music. Music is about programming. It's about structuring an evening. It's about your audience, and and I, I've... I've, uh, uh, I've, it helped me get over just thinking about music and the great songs and the great music I was going to play. So the mistake I made was losing focus on what being in the music business is about. That's a fantastic answer. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of art only for the sake of art. Uh, however, if you are trying to pay your bills by having an audience in front of you while you make your art and you're not thinking about the every aspect of the audience experience, don't be baffled when you also have to do another job that you don't want to be doing in order to, you know, to make ends meet. So that's what I try to tell my students. So, 100%. yeah. Uh, number three, what is a book you'd recommend uh, to a musical entrepreneur? <sighs> Can I can I can I have one and a half? Uh, you can have you can have two. Okay, so uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, the the book book I'm going to recommend is the uh, collected uh, uh, works of uh, uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky. Um, 
uh, I don't need you to read about music. You're going to study music. Um, I, I needed to kind of drill down into life and, and, and really kind of pull out the core and examine it and, and put it under the microscope. And, and it was my reading. For me, it was Dostoevsky who did that, the great Russian author, mm-hmm. Crime and Punishment, uh, The Idiot. And, and, and even though he was a terrible, nasty human being, he was a racist and all those things, uh, he opened up the world and made me think of it in ways that, uh, again, informs music. It gets back to the insight that music is more than music. And by the way, if you don't like Dostoevsky, choose Tolstoy. If you don't like Tolstoy, choose Thomas Mann. If you don't like uh, Thomas Mann, choose uh, the great uh, uh, novelist of England, uh, uh, English novelist, uh, uh, George Eliot. Uh, but but uh, move, so- move sideways from music. The Half is an article by Glenn Gould that he wrote in the 1960s called The Prospects of Recording. If you haven't read it and you're in music, then you're not in music. You haven't, you haven't made the grade. Glenn Gould in, in the 1960s and probably before pretty much predicted everything that would happen today and that you described, Drew, with our big television sets. He predicted how recording would overtake live music. He predicted how recording was a different art. Uh, he talked about recording uh, uh, as, 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 uh, as a different art and how audiences would be different from the sit-back lean back audiences of the 1950s and 60s and before. So the prospects of recording by Glenn Gould, I'm pretty sure it's online, but certainly it's in a book called The Glenn Gould Reader um, that was edited by the great uh, music critic Tim Page. So um, if, it, if it has to be a book and not an article, then I'd say The Glenn Gould Reader. Very interesting. I, the members of the podcast know that uh, members, members, yeah, we have members. No, listeners to the podcast know that I tend to say interesting after every answer, which I'm starting to correct. But that was a very interesting answer, so I had to say interesting. So um, the that's that's great in terms of uh, yeah. I, I tell all of my students that they have to have a life outside of music, um, and that doesn't give them the. Uh, they need to practice as long as they need to practice. Some it'll be more, some it'll be less. But to learn that E flat major thirteenth uh, chord, you know, they 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 have to know it. But if you don't have your heart broken, if you're not excited, if you're not scared, if you're not all that stuff, uh, whether it be through literature or through through uh, experiencing it yourself, then you're going to make a, a crappy artist. So and all the sales in the world and and networking and all that crap isn't going to really amount to anything. So interesting. Yep. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> number, number, number four. Um, who do you look up to as an arts entrepreneur? Um, Ray Charles. There you go. Uh, there's nobody who doesn't love Ray Charles music or at least very few people. Um, he's a man who, who can be found, uh, under, uh, almost every pigeonhole in music except classical country, soul, R and B, pop, jazz, and he made his own career. He ran his own show. Uh, he never let it go, and, and yet he was a fabulous musician. And by the way, he wasn't such a great piano player, but he was a great piano player. So he, he embodied all the things he made. He made, as far as, uh, he was a great singer and a great arranger. So he made a lot with a little from, from in terms of you know pianistic technique. Um, he, he, and, uh, he took a great vocal talents and he ran it as a business and he, he succeeded like nobody, like nobody else. Uh, that's a great answer. Uh, and finally, number five, uh, what have you always wanted to achieve in the music business that you haven't to this point? Income. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, I wonder actually, uh, uh, the, 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 um, the answer is, I think, it is the answer that every musician wants to give when they're asked what they're looking for in a career in music. Um, uh, a, a, a reasonable number of shows per year with a relatively reliable revenue stream that will allow me to support the musicians uh, who work and, and other staff that work with me, uh, but also support uh, me and, 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 and my, my spouse in, in a, um, in a, in a reasonable lifestyle, uh, that, uh, remains musically interesting and, and not, uh, and not repetitive. And that has a, 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 a regular business cycle. So in other words, uh, what I've yet to achieve is to turn this, this crazy world of music, uh, into 
a relatively normal, whatever normal means, living. Um, but, you know, I, I, I continue to do it. And, um, and uh, we, all, we always have to have something to strive for. Otherwise, I think we get lazy. And, uh, and I do, do believe it, it is attainable. Fantastic. Well, uh, this has been a pleasure. Uh, we're a little bit long, but uh, but that's uh, because uh, yeah, I was I was very fascinated by all of your very interesting answers. So um, the uh, oh. so yeah, thank you so much for joining us, but, but Drew. It's, it's an honor, and uh, I think what you do is great. I, you know, from your days in, in in the Boston Brass, I I just I'm so glad that we uh, connected, and uh, and I still got to get you up here to do a project with Symphonica. Believe me, I haven't I haven't forgotten that. Yeah, an I'm, evening with tuba. Yeah, that would be that'd, that'd be a blast. So yeah, we're we're gonna do that. We just got to figure out when and how. So and you and you have to practice your E flat major thirteen. Yeah, I, I would have to. Uh, yeah, I, I have to start counting when I get to a thirteenth. <laughs> so yeah, it's like I can. You lose me. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 a typical classical player who can sometimes fake jazz. Where like a ninth, I got it. Anything above that, I'm like. <laughs> Like, wait, whoa, 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 wait, 13th, hold on, that's how many above the ninth, and then, yeah, so. I'll, I'll give you a, just, just subtract six, and you'll have the number. Just subtract six, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's easy, you're a tuba player, just do math on the fly while you're, uh, yeah, <laughs> while you're emoting, and it, what could possibly go wrong? Um, so uh, you can find uh, Ron at uh, rondavismusic.com, uh, where you can uh, sign up for his newsletter. Um, he is also um, at Ron Davis Music on Twitter, and uh, he has a Facebook uh, fan page. And uh, what is your uh, YouTube channel? Ron Davis Music. Okay, that's what I, I assumed. I was uh, I didn't want to Google that in the middle of this in case any any videos started uh, auto playing. I'm still trying to figure out. You heard a bunch of clicking noises a little while ago, and that's because I had Slack open, uh, which is what we use uh, for Pedal Note Media. And Lance started posting a whole bunch of stuff, and I was trying to I was trying to shut it up, uh, and I to the the push notifications, and then I was like rambling. And uh, yeah, we're um, we're all about uh, Seth Godin's minimum viable product. You know, like always be shipping. So we. we we claim that we're podcast experts, but we're still we're still learning. So, um, so all right. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ron, and uh, that will do it for another episode of the Entrepreneurial Musician. You've been listening to the Entrepreneurial Musician with Andrew Hitz on the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. If you would like to help support the podcast in order to make more episodes like this one possible, please visit pedalnotemedia.com/donate for more details. You can sign up for my monthly newsletter and find my blog at andrewhits.com. You can also find me at facebook.com slash hitstuba, and I'm at hitstuba on Twitter. The Entrepreneurial Musician is produced by Austin Boyer and Buddy Deschler of the Fredericksburg Brass Institute. Executive producer is Andrew Hitz. The theme music was performed by Ben Barron, Rich Kelly, Daniel LaPelle, and Andrew Hitz. This has been a presentation of the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network.